Hi, everyone. Welcome to the final day of MBA Spotlight. Um, it's been a pretty long week. We have had several business schools come in, talk about their programs. We also did a lot of profile evaluations on the GMAT Club chat. And we also had a ton of current students coming in and talking about their MBA experiences. So to kick off our final day, we have Imran from the Rothman uh, School uh, from the University of Toronto. Imran, why don't you take it away? Right. Uh, thank you, Sovik. Um, so before uh, you know, before I get started with the uh, Rotman presentation, I just wanted to uh, you know give a shout out to all of you guys for taking time on a you know on a Saturday morning or afternoon or, or, or evening, um, you know, to uh, to be here and to learn more about not only Rotman but all of the other uh, programs that are participating. Uh, you know, you guys are taking the first step in a, a very long process, which is, um, you know, uh, identifying what universities um, would be a, a good fit for you and, and learning more about the admissions process and, and then finally going through the application cycle. So um, thank you, guys. I'm really excited to be here and I hope uh, that this session is going to be informative for you. Um, just by, you know, if you could type into the, the live comments, maybe where you guys are, are signing in from, just so I can uh, have a sense of, um, you know, where, where you guys are. And also if, you know, I'm audible and, and visible. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. Toronto, we got the US, we got India. Philippines, amazing. Right. Fantastic. So um, I'm going to get started. So my name is Imran Kanga. I'm the director of uh, recruitment and admissions for the full time MBA program um, at the Rotman School of Management, which is uh, business school at the University of Toronto. Um, I always like to start um, my, my presentation with a little bit of context on um, the city of Toronto and our location, uh, because that's such a major factor in deciding where to go to business school. And uh, Toronto really has some great advantages, um, you know, that, that uh, MBA students can, can really take advantage of. So, uh, we're known as the city of opportunity, um, you know, lots of uh, job opportunities available for young professionals in many, many different industries. Uh, we've been ranked by The Economist as one of the best places in the world to live. Uh, PwC ranks us number three in the world for uh, global city of opportunity. So this is especially important for uh, young entrepreneurs who are looking to set up businesses um, in Canada post their post their MBA or, or master's program. Uh, and we're also one of the most multicultural and welcoming um, countries and cities in the world. Uh, in fact, over 50% of Toronto's population was actually born outside of, of, uh, of Canada. So we're really a, a cultural melting pot of people from all over the world. Uh, speaking, you know, over 150 languages. Um, and so you really get that diversity by living in the city, but also that spills over into the MBA program. Uh, and you really get exposed to different cultures, different perspectives and different ways of life. Um, from a business context, though, there's over 800,000 businesses in the city of Toronto, uh, over uh, around 40% of all of Canada's business headquarters are located in Toronto across all sectors and all industries. Uh, for those of you who are interested in tech, uh, you know, Toronto also has the third largest tech sector in North America. So really um, great, great place to, to start or build a career. Um, Bay Street, which is, um, you know, uh, it, it's sort of the Wall Street uh, of Toronto is located and this map kind of gives you a, a, a sense of location uh, where Rotman is located and, you know, where Bay Street is located. So we're right in the downtown core of the city, which really is a huge advantage for um, 
you know, for, for students in the MBA program because it gives you access to so many, you know, recruit, uh, recruitment managers, alumni that are all working in the downtown core. So many of our students really take advantage of this, uh, of this location. Um, if you, so, you know, and while we're very strong in sort of tech and finance, uh, you know, Toronto is a large financial hub as well. But, you know, students who are interested in healthcare, for example, uh, you know, we're minutes away from the University Health Network, which is the world's largest network of hospitals and healthcare research centers. Um, you know, we're uh, about a block away from the Mars Discovery District, which is one of the world's largest uh, innovation hubs. Um, so again, if you, you know, uh, for students interested in, in social impact, in healthcare, uh, technology, artificial intelligence, there's lots of opportunities uh, in that space right around uh, the corner from the Rotman School. And um, location does matter. So, you know, Bay Street, uh, which I just mentioned a, a minute ago, is, is home to not only the, the, the financial hub, but it's also home to some of the major, you know, world's largest recruiters in multiple different industries. Um, and having that proximity to industry allows students to build a network uh, while they're in the program. So here's an example of, a, of you know, one of our students, and, and this is a representative of many of our students who really use um, the location to their advantage um, to, you know, really build those connections and networks um, that would ultimately help with, um, you know, career outcomes. So that's the city of Toronto, and, and uh, that's, you know, a little bit about our location. Uh, I'd like to talk now about the University of Toronto, uh, because, you know, we're an integral part of the university, and, um, you know, you know, the University of Toronto does have a, a global reputation. So uh, we are ranked as the number one university in Canada. Uh, we're, we're ranked in, um, 21 uh, the, for the number 21 in the world outside of the, um, you know, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 21 in the world and number six outside of the U.S., okay? Uh, we're about 200 years old. Uh, we've had a, a long history of graduating some, uh, you know, uh, you know, a lot of politicians, top scholars, academics, and researchers. We also have, uh, being the largest university in the country, we have an alumni uh, base of um, over half a million alumni spread across the world. And the 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 reputation of the university is is not only you know, it's not only instrumental to attracting top talent uh, in terms of students, so we do, you know, bring together top minds, uh, top students from all across the world to, to study at Rotman and at U of T, but this uh, global reputation also attracts some of the top faculty in the world uh, to not only teach, but also conduct research. So University of Toronto is a research intensive institution. Uh, a, pr a great example is Professor Sarah Kaplan. Uh, Professor Kaplan uh, teaches strategic management in, in the MBA program. So she teaches the core strategy course um, to the first, first year students in the MBA. Uh, Sarah, you know, completed a PhD from, from MIT. She worked at McKinsey in New York for about a decade uh, before starting at Rotman. And uh, her research area is in the, uh, in the space of uh, gender equality and gender balance in the workplace. And she's doing some really important work with not only the, the private sector, but also government to help change policies, um, you know, that will, that will uh, contribute to having uh, gender equity or, um, you know, gender balance in the workplace. It's really a, a topical issue, uh, you know, these days with diversity and inclusion. And uh, I'm really happy and proud that uh, Professor Kaplan is, is making real strides in this area. Um, also, uh, you know, uh, being the top ranked university in the country, we also attract uh, a lot of uh, politicians, ac you know, uh, senior business leaders, uh, and academics uh, in term, uh, with speaking events throughout the year. So Rotman hosts over a hundred public speaking events um, 
you know, these could be book launches, panel discussions, um, and re really bringing together, um, you know, thought leaders in, in different areas. So here's some of the, uh, you know, a few of the, of the many speakers that we've had in the recent past. Um, and as students in the MBA program, um, you know, you're able to, uh, you know, attend any of these speaking events for free. Um, and so really, you know, allows you to expand your perspective, uh, your knowledge and your network um, while you're in the program. So I'd like now to talk a, a little bit more about the structure of our MBA program. Um, we have a 16 month uh, a program plus a four month flexible internship. So uh, it's a it's a pretty standard program in terms of the breakup. You do the first two terms or eight months um, of core courses. You then have a one term um, internship and then you have the next two terms or eight months uh, of electives. So that's a 20 month um, full time program and it's considered a two year academic year uh, MBA program. So, so that's sort of the structure uh, where Rotman differs from um, other two year programs in, um, in Canada is you know, we're the only we're the only business school that has a um, um, internship that's a part that's a mandatory component of our MBA. So every single Rotman student has to complete an internship as part of the program. Uh, it's it's flexible uh, in that you can take the you, know, you can complete the internship either in the summer uh, once you've completed your first year uh, or you could do it in the fall or the winter term in your second year. So the time when you do your internship is is really up to you. Um, most students, however, do take the um, do complete the internship requirement in the summer. That's just when most of the companies uh, are hiring, and most companies have structured internship or, or summer placement programs for our students. Um, so the first year um, core courses are kind of prescribed courses that all students have to take in order to build a strong foundation in business, and this covers. Um, you know, all of the different business functions or areas like marketing, finance, accounting, economics, um, you know, strategy, operations, uh, you, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, but just to give you sort of a bird's eye view of all of the different business functions, how they work together uh, to make organizations run. Um, in the second year, when you go into your elective courses, that's where you can really customize and design your program based on your specific career interests or, or goals. Um, so we have 15 different areas of interest to choose from. Um, here's the list uh, there, and, and you can get more information about all of the, you know, over 100 elective courses offered in these 15 different areas um, on our website. So it really gives you a chance to pick and choose courses from one or two or even three different areas and combine that experience to make it customized for you. Um, so that's just a little bit about our structure. Um, I also, you know, I, I do realize that uh, this presentation time is quite short, so I wanted to just focus the next few minutes on a few, um, you know, really unique and distinguishing factors that make Rotman um, a pretty unique uh, place to do an MBA. So, uh, you know, in addition to the academic experience, what Rotman prides itself on is the co-curricular experience of our students. So we give students a, so much more opportunity to learn and grow uh, outside of the classroom, and that, that has become kind of an integral part of the, of the MBA program. So uh, to start off with, you know, the Creative Destruction Lab, um, Rotman was the first business school to set up, um, you know, a creative destruction lab, which is a tech incubator focused on disruptive technologies like um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, quantum computing, healthcare, space technology, um, and and this was start, uh, founded in 2012. So since 2012, um, you know, we've had several different successful startups. Uh, go through the, the destruction of the CDL program uh, and to date it, I believe it has generated over three billion dollars in equity value for um, for the companies that it has incubated so that makes it one of the fastest growing 
um, tech incubators anywhere in the world. Um, as students in the MBA program, you know, you do get a chance to, um, to participate in, in CDL workshops. Uh, we also have uh, a CDL fellowship program where students who are, you know, who either come from uh, a tech background or a startup background or are interested in to, to getting into those um, spaces uh, or industries once they're done with the MBA. Uh, as a CDL fellow, you have to, there's a, an academic component, so you do have to take um, a CDL course. Um, as one of your electives, but you also get a chance to complete your internship with the CDL um, or one of the startups that are, uh, you know, a part of the CDL uh, program. So you not only get, um, you know, mentorship from entrepreneurs, VC firms, uh, you also get a chance to really, you know, understand from entrepreneurs what their challenges are and, and what it really takes to take a business idea and scale it in the marketplace. Um, now, in addition to uh, tech, we also have a lot of international experiences planned for our students. So, you know, for those of you who are looking to get some additional international exposure, uh, we offer 24 exchange programs for one semester um, in, in 17 different countries. So for those of you who are interested in, in you know, learning more about a, a, a region or, or, or a country, um, you know, learning more about the culture and the way business is done in a different part of the world, um, you know, you can spend one uh, of your two semesters in your second year going on exchange. We also have shorter trips, so uh, global practicums uh, ranging from three to four weeks that we that we do in different parts of the world. And then uh, for students who are interested in consulting, we have numerous live consulting projects um, that happen throughout the first and second year as well. So um, lots of international opportunities for our students. Um, another really important initiative that Robman has taken um, is really focusing on soft skills development. So, you know, we, we understand that you come to do an MBA program to develop some hard skills and, you know, finance and strategy and, and operations. Uh, but it's also really important um, to maximize your leadership potential, uh, you know, uh, and develop your soft skills. And, and Rotman has taken that really a step further using, um, you know, technologies like facial recognition and artificial intelligence. We've developed a, a, a lab that allows you to, uh, you know, really become, uh, you know, complete exercises and workshops in order to improve your self-awareness, uh, negotiation skills, presentation skills, uh, you know, managing team dynamics. Um, that's going to be, become even more important now, uh, you know, for the foreseeable future in a virtual environment uh, in the workplace. So uh, this, the self-development lab, which was developed by Dr. Maya Jikic and a Harvard-trained clinical um, psychologist uh, whose, er whose area of expertise was per, um, leadership development and personality development, um, you know, uh, Maya and um, uh, this, this um, uh, doctor have really created a curriculum that allows you to quantify your progress as you go through the different stages of the self-development lab. And this is available to students, uh, not only in a group setting, but also on a one-to-one -one coaching, uh, in a one-to-one -one coaching environment while you're in the program. Um, I think uh, maybe only student, uh, the, the attendees from Toronto would know who this person is. But, uh, you know, the reason I have this slide up here is to show, uh, showcase that, you know, in addition to all of the co-curricular activities that Rotman has in, in terms of resources for students, we also encourage students to take on more leadership responsibilities and roles as Part of, you know, as part of ver uh, various student clubs and organizations that are on campus. So uh, this is uh, Masai Ujiri. He's the president of the uh, of the Toronto Raptors, which is our uh, basketball team. For those of you who don't follow basketball, 
But, um, you know, uh, we had a student, uh, Tyler Flexman, who was really interested in the business of sports and sports management. And, um, you know, she took it all upon herself to really create that as, a, as an area of focus for, uh, for students, not only not in terms of a curriculum, but uh, she, she went on to founding the Rotman Sports Association. And through that, was able to build a network in that in that industry and bring Maasai on campus to um, to talk to students about the business of sports. Uh, through that connection, she was then able to um, get a, a, a role uh, with the Ma with Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment post graduation. So, um, you know, while Rotman does create these kinds of opportunities for you. Uh, we also encourage students to go out there, expand their impact, and create these opportunities for themselves. Uh, you know, the platform is there for you to do that. So another reason why it's really important to pick the right program is uh, diversity. You want to, uh, you know, one of the biggest takeaways you're going to have from this experience is the network and the connections and friendships that you build through through the MBA program. And, and this is another area where Rotman has a, a major advantage because we are the largest MBA program in the country with uh, a cohort uh, that starts once a year uh, with 300 students. So, um, you know, you, you, you have a, you're part of a large cohort of students However, you still benefit from a small class size because each class uh, or each cohort is divided into um, different, uh, you know, four sections of about 65 to 70 students in each section. Um, but you're still part of the larger Rotman community because you get to network not only with your class, but also the incoming class and the outgoing class. So you graduate with an immediate network of about a thousand, uh, you know, MBA students. Uh, and then once you graduate, you go on to joining a, lar a much larger alumni community of 15,000 MBA alumni spread across, um, you know, over 90 countries across the world. Uh, I'd like to now talk a little bit about um, careers. So Rotman's Career Center has been ranked number one in Canada for employability by the Financial Times, uh, and I think our, our numbers speak for themselves. Um, you know, 90% of our students are employed within three to six months of graduation, um, and average salaries are in excess of 110,000 Canadian dollars, including, you know, signing bonuses, um, but not annual bonuses. Um, as international students, you, um, you also have the benefit of a three-year post-graduation work permit, uh, which allows you to work with any company anywhere across Canada for three years. And it is uh, one of the pathways to getting your permanent residency. It, should you choose to, um, you know, um, stay on and work and live in Canada after that three year period. So um, that was the, that was the end of my presentation. I just wanted to, um, uh, give you our new admission deadlines because they were just launched last week. So uh, we are going to be starting our application cycle earlier this year with an early round in, um, um, in the first week of August. Uh, so our application portal will open in the first week of July to give students one month to submit their applications for the early round. Uh, and then our regular admission cycle will start with round one in October. Um, so just wanted to mention that these, these dates are, are now, um, you know, have, have now been fixed and are, are published on the website. Okay. Um, so that's it for me, uh, in terms of the presentation, I'd love to open it up now to some Q and A if, if anyone has questions for, for me about the Rotman program or, or about the admissions process. Hey, Brian. Hey, Sovik. Hey, uh, of course we're getting a ton of questions. So I, what I try to do is streamline the questions into different okay. phases of the MBA. So I'll Thank start you. with some admissions and some application questions, and then I'll move on to some MBA experiences questions. And then finally, uh, we'll touch upon some post MBA career and recruiting questions. That sounds good? That's awesome. Okay, so talking about MBA admissions, um, 
we're getting a lot of questions about what are the typical traits and attributes that Rotman looks for in a potential candidate. And uh, this sort of gives people like a cheat code when they are presenting their application. So any thoughts would be great. So, sir, I'm so sorry, but you cut off there for a second. Oh, um, really? can you, yeah, can you repeat that? Yeah, yeah. So what I uh, was asking was that uh, are there some typical attributes or typical features that you like to see in applicants that makes you more comfortable in saying yes to them? Okay, okay. So, yeah, the, the only part of the question I heard the first time was secret code. So, it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, okay, so so what is the secret sauce to being a successful applicant at Rotman? Um, mm -hmm. Right, so there's really four things, um, you know, uh, four things that we look for in, uh, in an applicant. The first is intellectual, um, it's what we call intellectual horsepower, but it's really uh, a candidate's academic ability. You know, um, uh, the Rotman MBA program is one of uh, the most intense, intensive MBA programs out there. Um, it's not designed to be easy. Uh, you know, it's really designed to push and challenge the students. So um, one thing we definitely look for is academic ability. And, and so we look at, uh, you know, the G, uh, GMAT scores or GRE scores. Uh, we look at uh, students' undergraduate uh, GPA. You know that that does play an important role. Uh, the second, you know, the second aspect we look for is um, you know experience and impact. So uh, you know, of course, students coming into the program need to have some work experience. But more important than the number of years is really the impact that students have had in their organizations prior to joining the MBA. So, you know, you may have worked for two years or three years, but you may have accomplished a lot and you may have been a huge value add to your to your company. Um, you know, and that's great versus someone who stayed in the same, you know, who hasn't really shown any career progression for four, five or six years. Right. Uh, you know, so someone who's really uh, contributed and added value, um, you know, that's a, a strong applicant for us because that demonstrates leadership potential. You know, the there is, um, you know, it shows that the student is taking initiative. So so that's really important for us. Okay. The third is communication and presence. So, you know, it's great to have um, strong academic scores um, and great work experience. But if you're not an effective communicator, um, you know, you're you're not going to be successful either in the program or after the program in the in the workplace. So that's definitely something that we place some emphasis on. Um, and the last uh, the last component that we that we test for and look for is something we call spike factor. So you know, in addition to um, you know all your your grades, your academics, your work experience, what makes you what makes you stand out? Uh, what makes you a unique and interesting individual? Um, you know, uh, so that's where we and, and our essay it revolves around a student's spike factor. So uh, right. really, you know, getting students to think outside of the box and think about the value addition that they bring to the MBA. Um, and, you know, and highlight it gives them a chance to highlight um, interesting things about themselves. You know, maybe they set a goal for themselves and were able to accomplish it. You know, that shows grit and determination. So, so that's what, that's essentially what we look for in, a, in an MBA applicant. We did get a few questions around how to showcase their spike factor. So I'm yeah. really glad you brought it up. Um, getting a few questions around deadlines. And uh, I know your last slide sort of gave the deadlines for the upcoming year. But um, talking about the early round and um, the benefits of applying early, so does selectivity stay the same across all rounds, or would you recommend people to apply early to have a better shot at getting in? I definitely think that um, you know applying early uh, is an advantage. Uh, you know, selectivity. I think just in terms of numbers, it has to get more competitive, right? Because right. You know, when you're when you start off at the start of an admission cycle, we have 300 spots in the MBA program. You know, mm -hmm. as every round goes, um, as every round goes by, you know, those spots get um, fewer and fewer. You know, so if you're applying in round four, uh, you know, you may have a, a wonderful application, but if we just don't have any space to uh, to give, you know, to offer you, 
then right. we we wouldn't be able to give you admission. You know, so uh, definitely er, applying early is is advisable, and and that's not only in terms of you know selectivity and, and uh, being competitive to get in. It's also for scholarships, right? We have um, you know a, a, about five million dollars in scholarship funds that we give out every year to students. Um, right. Our average scholarship amount is about twenty thousand hmm. dollars, and about you know seventy to eighty percent of our students receive some level of funding. However, you know our our funding is is a lot. Um, uh, we have a lot more funds available at the start of the cycle than at the end right. of the cycle. So back to my same example, you know you may have a, a, an amazing application. You know if you had applied in in round one, you know we may have been able to give you thirty thousand dollars. Sure. As a scholarship, but in round four, you know that's going to be ten thousand, maybe. You know, right. so so applying early definitely makes sense. Um, and our scholarships, because a question just popped up there, uh, yeah. scholarships are merit based, so they're based on the merits of your entire application, mm -hmm. um, and that's why every single component of the application is important. So it's not a merit based scholarship just based on academics, for example. Um, it's really based on the whole package. Awesome. So, um, so to talk about more in t in terms of the MBA experiences, and I think I'm. By the way, I'm glad you brought up scholarships because uh, and financial aid because that was going to be my next question, and I uh, we're getting a ton of those. Um, to talk about the MBA experiences, so Rotman, uh, of course, is um, the probably the top ranked school in Canada. Uh, but it also competes with uh, other North American schools and uh, right. both schools in the U.S. So if somebody, international student especially, uh, chooses to switch geographies to come to North America, um, they generally essentially have Rotman versus a couple of other schools. So can you tell us a little bit about how the Rotman MBA experience is unique that helps them in school selection and help them decide uh, to pick Rotman over other schools, both in terms of applying to schools, but also in choosing which one to finally attend. Yeah, so, you know, if, if you're comparing, uh, it's not really, I mean, you know, yes, we, we do often, uh, you know, uh, gets, we're, we're often competing with, you know, schools like Duke and Cornell and NYU. Um, it's it's hard to compare them as, as apples to apples though because you know we're in a completely different country right <laughs> even though you know every, everyone thinks of north america as sort of you know one bucket like canada is quite different from from the us in, in many ways sure. so you know the benefit or the unique advantage for a student coming to canada is you know you get the same if not better uh, quality of education um, as you would at any other top school, you know, a majority of our, our faculty, you know, have uh, our, you know, our international, many of them coming from the U.S. that have, you know, PhDs and that have taught at, uh, at these schools. In fact, our academic director, uh, Will, Will Mitchell, uh, you know, teaches at, at Rotman full time. He's the academic director of the full time MBA program, but he's also an adjunct faculty member at Duke. You know, so right. so you're getting the same um, level of of teaching. You know, the same curriculum, the same intensity. However, because we're in Canada, you know, universities in Canada are publicly funded, so they're public institutions, which means mm -hmm. there are significant cost savings for students entering, um, you know, Canadian universities because they're heavily subsidized by the government. Whereas a lot of the top schools in the U.S. are private, so you know, the, the cost of tuition is a lot more. And I think what where, um, you know, we're also at a major advantage is in terms of ROI, you know, because not only are you, you know, not only is, let's say, a, a, an MBA program in the U.S. a lot more costly, but your the time you're given to recover that investment uh, is not guaranteed, right? Yeah. You know, you have an OPT that's given to you after graduation. And then once that OPT runs out, you know, it's it's a lottery system. Right. Whereas in Canada, you're guaranteed that ROI because you, you're you given, you know, a three year uh, permit to, to live and work in the country. And then given the option to stay on after that by, by becoming a permanent resident and then a Canadian citizen, you know, it's a, right. it's a very structured and easy path to follow. So, 
Uh, you know, so I think the ROI piece is is really important, and you can't um, underestimate that um, that advantage. Awesome. Uh, by the way, thanks for touching on that too, because I had a few immigration questions as well. So you covered yeah. that. That's awesome. Uh, questions around diversity and how does um, having a diverse background play within the experience at Rotman? And you touched on that when you talked about Toronto as a whole. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit more about diversity within Rotman and how you have seen that, um, you know, really drive the MBA experience. Well, I mean, you know, when I when I think of diversity, I don't just think of students coming in from different countries. You know, mm -hmm. I also think of it uh, as diversity in perspectives and you know, diversity in education and work backgrounds because that also adds different layers of diversity to a student's experience. So, you know, starting off with you know ethnic diversity in terms of where students come from. Uh, Again, Rotman and I think most Canadian schools are at a major advantage compared to U.S. Uh, to the U.S. You know, I, because our percentage of international students is significantly higher. Uh, right. At Rotman, for example, sixty percent of our students are international; forty percent are are domestic. Um, you know, and and we bring in students from forty to forty-five countries every year. So. Right. That's a tremendous amount of diversity. But why I was talking about the multiculturalism of Toronto and how that spills over into the classroom is when we're looking at ethnic diversity, you know, those 40% that are Canadian are Indian Canadian or Chinese Canadian or Latin American Canadian, you know, or Asian. So, um, so that also brings in a different layer of, of diversity. But that's just ethnic diversity, right? Um, you know, if you look at in diversity in backgrounds of students, um, you know, only 30% of our students come from uh, a business background. So 70% are non-business students coming in from, uh, you know, all different walks of life, like, um, you know, the arts, the human right. humanities, social sciences. You know, we have, we've had professional athletes in the program. We've had musicians in the program. Uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, students coming in from the military. So, you know, if you think about that diversity, you know, think about yourself in a Rotman MBA classroom uh, with students from not only all around the world, but, you know, put, you're put into groups with, um, you know, an actor or a musician or, right. uh, you know, so a doctor or a lawyer. You're learning so much from their perspective. Um, you know, they bring a lot to the table, as you do. Uh, you know, so you're learning from them, they're learning from you, and, and that's why diversity matters. Awesome. Um, moving away and talking a little bit about post MBA opportunities, by the way, I'm getting a few more admission questions, so I might circle back those to you in case we get the time. Yeah. But to talk about post MBA opportunities, and you mentioned, you know, like some of the top recruiters, but um, do you see any trends in how post MBA employers have changed? Tech has probably become a lot bigger um, and probably have taken over some stats from consulting and finance. Right. But any trends would be great. And also, what do you see most Rotman students going in after their MBA? So, um, you know, the, I, I don't like answering this question because uh, it's, it's, I don't think it's representative of the school per se, uh, sure. you know, because of where, to, you know, where we are, we're in Toronto, which is, uh, you know, a huge financial, uh, financial center and a commercial, a commercial hub as well. Sure. Um, you know, a majority of our students uh, work, you know, so let's say about 25 to 30% end up working in, in banking. You know, right. investment banking, corporate banking, um, financial services, retail banking, but the banking sector is is huge in Toronto, mm -hmm. right? So, um, you know, we have a lot of students working in in, in banking and finance. Um, second is consulting. Um, you know, it's about twenty to twenty five percent of our students work in in consulting. Uh, again, I think that's driven by where we're located, but also student preference. You know, finance and consulting are the highest paying industries for students right. to get into. So there is, you know, students naturally do tend to gravitate towards those jobs. Hmm. Um, but to your point, uh, Sovik, I think that is changing, you know. So the other sectors that are growing like tech, uh, you know, students are now seeing a lot more opportunity getting in at, you know, at early stage startups. 
Yeah. Um, you know, and, and that's growing. There's a huge tech cluster now, um, you know, that's shifted from Silicon Valley to, to Toronto uh, because of, you know, the, the there's so many universities and so much talent available in the city that it, you know, it has attracted some of these employers to our, to our city. Right. Uh, so tech, you know, if you look maybe seven, eight years ago, uh, the number of students working in tech was maybe four or five percent. Today it's 14 percent. You know, wow. and that, that trend is growing. Right. So, um, you know, now a lot of uh, with the with the introduction of, you know, analytics and uh, fintech and artificial intelligence, you know, there's a lot of tech roles available in traditional businesses. Right. And that's the that's the bridge that the CDL uh, Creative Destruction Lab provides students. So, you know, if you want to work in analytics, you could work in analytics, but you could work at a bank in analytics, you know, or you could work with a credit card company in analytics, right. like Amex and MasterCard, they and Visa, like they recruit from us as well. So, um, yeah, so there's just a lot of, uh, of options now in, in, in tech, in the tech space, in the tech sector. Um, the other, you know, the other very popular uh, industry is marketing. Um, yeah. you know, con CPG, consumer packaged goods companies, um, for students who are looking to get into uh, marketing or branding, that's another popular sector as well. So yeah, I would say, you know, finance, consulting, tech, and marketing would be our, our the, the top sectors recruiting Robin students. Got it. A quick follow-up about CDL, getting a ton of questions about the Creative Destruction Lab. Uh, is there a specific path to the fellowship and uh, getting questions about the odds of that? Yeah, so the CDL uh, selects 20 students every year to be right. CDL fellows. Um, it comes, you know, uh, with a, a an internship uh, a, and a stipend, of course. But more than more than the internship opportunity, you know, uh, Rockman hosts one of the largest machine learning conferences uh, in the world, um, and you know, it attracts, um, for example, uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau uh, visited the last machine learning conference along with uh, members from Shark Tank and the Dragons Den who are looking to invest in some companies you know so right. it really attracts some top players in the in the vc and and startup space um so you know students as part of the cdl fellowship would get access to these kinds of learning opportunities like the conferences that that the cdl um you know hosts every year they get mentorship opportunities um from either entrepreneurs or faculty that are associated with the with the CDL, uh, and then of course the the internship opportunity as well. And so, if students have a business idea that they would like to develop as part of the um, you know as part of their MBA experience, they can do that with the CDL fellowship. Awesome, um, Imran. We are almost out of time, but uh, if you had any last thought for our community, that would be awesome. It was great having you here, but, uh, oh, but thank uh, you. I'm eager to hear from you again. Um, no, I, you know, I, I thought it was an hour session, so I'm sorry. I, I didn't know if it was 45 minutes. Um, uh, I had no worries at all. Okay. So since I only have one minute, <laughs> uh, I just, I'll just say, you know, uh, a a, again, a big thank you to everyone uh, for attending. It, this is not an easy time for any of us. Um, you know, I just, I hope that you and your loved ones are, are safe. Um, and also good luck to all of you, uh, you know, with your, um, with your next step. Um, you know, if it's an MBA program in your near future, good luck. Uh, if Rotman or I can be of, of support, please feel free to reach out. Uh, if there's a way for me to share my, uh, you know, my email address or our admissions email address, I'll, I'll do that. Uh, it's, you know, please, uh, visit our website, all of our contact information and a lot more, um, uh, information about the program is available on the website. So uh, please stay in touch. And um, I, you know, I, I look forward to interacting with all of you um, after this. This was just the, the start of uh, the conversation and I hope the conversation continues. So uh, thank you, Sovic, and thank you to the GMAT Club for giving me, the, giving me this opportunity and this platform to, to, uh, to engage with uh, prospective students. And uh, I hope to hear from you. That's, that's all I have. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much, Imran. It was great having you. Thanks. Thank you, Sophie. Take care. Bye-bye.